Uh, so today uh, we are uh, meeting for the workshop on gender equality plans uh, implementation focusing on Central East European countries. I will be uh, your uh, first uh, co-trainer today. My name is Jovana Mihailovic Trbouts and uh, uh, Lorena uh, Payares Sanchez is my co-trainer. Lorena, please say hi. Hello, good morning to everyone. Yes, and uh, on the part of Gender Equality Academy, we will have uh, Ben Tenol uh, and Natasha Sega providing us with technical help. Uh, this workshop will be recorded. Uh, so I'm letting you know about that, uh, which includes video and chat. And uh, during uh, workshop today, uh, please do use chat for comments and sharing information uh, relevant for the workshop. So I will uh, start uh, my uh, presentation today. Um, so welcome to workshop of Gender Equality Academy. As far as I know, mo most of you have uh, uh, did not have experience of attending such a workshop. So. Um, let me introduce you a bit uh, our program. Um, Gender Equality Academy is a, a platform um, and a, a consortium uh, uh, of, and the project that uh, develops and implements a coherent and high quality capacity building programs on gender equality in research and innovation. Uh, just a second, I have a bit of technical problem with, yes. Um, it is based on state-of-the-art uh, knowledge and expertise. Uh, trainers like me and Lorena are uh, gender equality experts, practitioners or researchers from various uh, institutions, uh, organizations or freelancers uh, all over uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, Gender Equality Academy uh, helped us uh, develop our skills. Uh, we were part of train of trainings program and now we are doing uh, this series of workshop. Um, what is important and specific about Gender Equality Academy is that it provides tailor-made training material like uh, this one today, which was uh, specifically devised for uh, practitioners coming from Central Eastern Europe. Um, we are developing, uh, providing workshops and trainings for different target groups from uh, decision makers, people in position of power at universities and research performing organizations, as well as uh, human resources or gender equality or diversity officers at the institutions and of course uh, researchers interested in this topic. Uh, we are providing different formats from short uh, uh, two to three hour uh, workshops uh, to uh, workshops that can last for three days. Uh, before the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there were uh, available um, uh, live uh, trainings as well. At the moment, they are all organized online like this one. So, uh, we are providing them in form or of a workshop, which are more interactive, like the one uh, you are having today, or more uh, a webinar style of uh, presentation. And there is, of course, a summer school, also in online form, which takes a longer period of time and a person can follow it uh, uh, through uh, working on their own and uh, online uh, interaction. Uh, and uh, uh, Gender Equal uh, Equality Academy has developed uh, uh, also DOCC. Uh, for today, uh, we will have uh, two uh, breaks um, and uh, our whole session will start, will last until uh, half past 3 p.m. So uh, in the first part, we will have introduction and explaining how gender equality has become requirement for Horizon Europe application. Um, and uh, some general overview of the situation in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, then we will have a short break uh, and uh, then we will go through first three steps in uh, creation of gender equality plan. 
uh, then we will have a bit longer break, half an hour for uh, a bit of a lunch or a snack. And then we will have a interactive part of the workshop where we will uh, work in breakout rooms uh, in working groups. And at the end, we have um, a wrap up and uh, evaluation. So at the end, we will ask you to fill in uh, exit questionnaire. So uh, to start with the uh, self, uh, short, short self introduction, uh, I will just uh, give you a few information about me and then Lorena will do the same. And then we will ask you to tell us just your name and institution you're coming from. So as I said, I'm Jovana Mihailovic Trbot. I'm a, a research fellow at the Research Center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts. And uh, 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 I am a memory scholar and gender equality scholar. Lorena. Hi. Thank you, Joana. I'm Lorena Pajares, and I work at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and I'm a researcher, and I also work as a trainer uh, here in the Gender Equality Academy, but also collaborating with other um, European projects. Um, and now I open the floor and I give you the floor to do the introduction, maybe. Giovanna, we can stop sharing the screen so we yes. can see each other faces at this point, which is- Yeah, nice. we will start maybe with, uh, uh, with a bit of introduction um, regarding uh, formalities and uh, something that is very relevant for uh, Central and Eastern European countries. As uh, probably most of you know, gender equality plan have become eligibility criterion for funding under Horizon Europe. Um, this is something that is very relevant for Central Eastern European countries uh, in majority, in which majority of institutions still do not have gender equality plan. So, uh, what it actually means. It means that all public institutions applying for call under Horizon Europe, uh, which is the ninth uh, framework program that will be in place until uh, 20, uh, 2017, that all public institutions applying for these calls need to have gender equality plan. Uh, I'm stressing public institutions since exceptions are small and medium enterprises and civil society organizations like non-governmental jo organizations. Joanna, so sorry to yes. interrupt. Um, the presentation is not on the slide. What we're seeing in the screen, it, it's... Thank you very much. So... Um, what it means, uh, so the way it will be at this moment uh, checked whether an institution has a gender equality plan is basically a self-declaration at the moment of applying for each consortium member uh, on, um, so on, for each institution within the consortium that is applying for a call. Uh, so it's basically something that institution will declare. And at this point, uh, European Commission will not check uh the the quality and the substance of a gender equality plan at this moment uh so the new requirement starts uh with calls in 2000 uh, in this year uh and uh, uh there is a, a one year transition period uh in place which means that uh this requirement will be um uh, uh, requirement without which you cannot apply from next year on. Uh, so in this one year period, institutions are uh, still able to apply without having a uh, gender equality plan in place, since uh, it is, uh, everybody are well aware that uh, creating and uh, uh, creating a gender equality plan takes a significant time and many institutions uh, are still in the process. So uh, it is also important to say that specific funding will be made available for action supporting the uh, development uh, uh, of inclusive gender equality plans uh, in research and innovation organization, especially uh, in uh, 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 for uh, countries uh, that are defined as widening countries. This means uh, new member states uh, of the EU. 
so look out for these uh, 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 calls in case uh, you need you want to get some external additional funding and of course support for creating gender equality plans. Um, the, this new rule has been announced uh, uh, practically one year ago uh, as part of gender equality strategy uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, it is a five-year strategy and uh, at that point it was uh, presented as a possibility which then evolved into a rule uh, which was announced by uh, Director General of uh, DG Research and Innovation uh, in September last year uh, on uh, one of the public events. Uh, so all the information that I'm sharing with you today are basically a summary of the uh, presentations that were given by different uh, uh, members of European Commission on different public events uh, uh, organized either by European Commission or European projects uh, like the ACT project uh, that your community of practice is part of. So uh, on one of such occasion, and that is uh, ACT project matching event uh, in October last year, Anne Pepin uh, from um, uh, Director General of Research and Innovation uh, explained that uh, gender equality plan are uh, are supposed to have following building blocks. That means that uh, it is recommended gender equality plans cover following areas. That is uh, measures relating to uh, issues of um, recruitment and career progression, then gender balance in leadership and decision-making, then work-life balance and organizational culture, uh, the fourth is integration of the gender dimension into research and teaching content. Uh, and uh, finally, gender-based violence, including sexual harassment. So it is not recommended what exact measures an institution is supposed to have, but rather uh, what that institutions should think whether they need some sort of an improvement in uh, following five areas. Uh, of potential problems. So um, what are the problems uh, that are at stake uh, in when we are uh, uh, um, thinking of uh, gender inequalities in academia and uh, which of them are specific or more typical for Central and Eastern Europe? Um, so the statistic is obviously uh, showing that there is inequality. Uh, proportion of women uh, uh, among researcher on the level of the whole EU in average is practically one third. So one third of the researchers are women. And we know that uh, uh, in many countries and in, in the EU in average, women constitute at least one half of undergraduate students in average. So there is a discrepancy between the number of educated people and number of people with, who are doing research uh, as a paid work. Um, there is also, yeah, I, would, I wanted to drag your attention also to one specificity uh, of Eastern Europe. And that is, if you look the average of the EU, maybe you will notice that many post-socialist countries or most post-socialist countries are significantly above the EU average. So uh, we have Latvia and Lithuania being above, uh, having a majority of researchers being women. So in Lithuania, we have a 50% point uh, seven. Then uh, we have uh, most of uh, former Yugoslav countries, Bal uh, Bulgaria, Romania, so the Balkan countries uh, tend to have uh, uh, somewhere around uh, between 40 and 50% of uh, women researchers. So in Slovi Slovakia, we have 42%, in Poland, 37 in Slovenia, 36 so the only uh, uh, post-socialist countries which are below the average are Hungary and uh, Czechia. Uh, Hungary having 30 and Czechia having 26%. Uh, percent. So um, 
there seems to be an obvious, uh, and I would say positive legacy of uh, socialism, uh, which uh, obviously enabled uh, a big number of women to enter various academic fields. And this tendency has uh, it still is reflected in the numbers today. However, if we compare proportion uh, or put together two uh, information and that is proportion of women researchers and uh, research and uh, uh, development expenditure uh, um, uh, yeah expand uh, research expenditure in purchasing power standards per researcher so basically uh, how much money is spent on um, uh, so uh, how much money there is within the country uh, compared to the number of researchers, we can see <clears throat> that uh, basically there are more women in countries which are, uh, um, which are, uh, which don't have so abundant uh, research funding and vice versa, the countries which have a higher uh, budgets uh, and higher expenditure on research and development uh, per researcher. Uh, in those countries, uh, so which there, therefore countries in which it is, uh, uh, there are uh, better uh, equipped to work or they have better funding, in those countries, women tend to be a larger minority. So this is, uh, uh, so to put uh, and simplify in short, in uh, many poor countries where not much money is spent on research, women uh, are uh, in, uh, in better position, at least in the, num in the numbers. So this is the structural problem on the European level that uh, in the countries, in, at the institutions, in the places where more money is spent, there are less women. And then in the institutions and countries which are uh, uh, more poor, um, there are a larger number of women. And this is something that was encapsulated by a concept that was, uh, uh, or uh, indicator that was uh, defined as honeypot indicator, meaning that uh, if we think of researchers as bees, uh, the, there are uh, more um, male bees around, more, uh, uh, around honeypots that are more full. So this is a measure of relationship between concentration of women and men and research and development expenditure. So the study uh, that has been conducted in 2003 uh, in which this indicator was defined for the first time and uh, proven with statistical data, uh, the study from 2003 showed uh, of the new member states showed that the highest proportion of women is to be found in the countries and sectors sectors with the lowest uh, research and development expenditure and that the lowest proportion of women uh, are in sectors where highest um, with the highest expenditure. So uh, we can also see uh, that uh, on the level of the European Union uh, that also women tend to, uh, women, female researcher tend to work in higher education uh, sector more than in business sector and uh, especially in the business intensive sector like uh, IT and other uh, technologies uh, where more money uh, is spent and where higher investments are created there are uh, less women. So these are some tendencies on European level which are spilling over also to um, Central and Eastern Europe and in some ways the uh, higher pace of uh, development of research uh, sector is actually uh, having a negative effect on gender equality at least in numbers. So um, uh, uh, in the statistic then tend to show actually smaller proportion of women in, in um, business uh, sector of the research. So this is um, uh, sort of a, 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 a 
this is one of the structural issues that are um, typical for whole of uh, the EU, but uh, has its own specificities in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, another typical feature, uh, another structural problem is horizontal segregation, meaning that even if we have parity among men and women in average among uh, research staff, men and women tend to orientate and work in different uh, study areas and disciplines. Uh, and uh, of course, this is something also that differs from countries to countries and is, is related to historical legacies uh, and also specificities uh, and culture of particular uh, setting. So it is important to know what is, uh, uh, what are the data uh, showing about your country and your institution before you embark uh, on institutional change. Another uh, common uh, another problem at stake is a vertical segregation. Uh, on your left side, you will see a uh, so-called scissors diagram showing uh, the blue line is showing men and the orange line is showing women and they, it is shown how uh, the numbers are showing different steps in the academic uh, uh, progress on, on the academic ladder. So you can see that uh, at the level of undergraduate and postgraduate studies, uh, women are uh, basically majority in Europe, uh, which comes to parity, which when we move to the level of um, doctoral studies. Uh, and uh, then when people start with academic career, I'm sorry, with the uh, academic career, we can see that uh, the, the discrepancy becomes larger, uh, meaning that there is much larger number of men and uh, number of uh, women are fiddling uh, uh, upper that we go up the academic uh, ladder. Uh, so uh, the two last uh, uh, dots uh, are showing the numbers of um, uh, two highest grade of uh, professors. So full professor and um, uh, uh, the level below, uh, depending on uh, how you call it in your language. And uh, this is the, the left side diagram is showing uh, numbers for the whole of research staff. These are data collected between 2013 and 16 and presented in she figures 2018. So the, the latest uh, comparative figures that we have. Uh, and then on the right hand uh, um, graph, you can see the data, particularly for uh, disciplines of science, engineering, uh, science and engineering. And there you can see that practically not at any level we have actually real gender equality parity uh, and that uh, women tend to be minority in all uh, levels, so from the undergraduate student and, of course, uh, to the level of a uh, university professor, a full university professor. Another, uh, so the what, what we are seeing here as a statistic is something that has been called leaky pipeline phenomenon uh, in, uh, though in analysis of um, uh, uh, of uh, gender equality uh, in, uh, uh, so in the analysis of uh, uh, researchers who are uh, working on gender equality in uh, academia. Uh, leaky pipeline uh, is uh, uh, a symbol for what is, uh, uh, for the phenomenon that women are sort of leaking out uh, when, uh, uh, when we look at the pipe of progression uh, from the student to the uh, imagined end uh, of, of a researcher's career as a senior researcher or full professor. Uh, concepts, so the, the what we are seeing in statistic and what we are calling leaky pipeline phenomenon uh, is, um, uh, is uh, uh, 
uh, a result of a combination of factors. And I'm going to present some of the concepts that are helping us explain um, uh, why, why this uh, discrepancy happens. Uh, so uh, one of the concepts is, uh, so one, one of the causes of the problem is what we call sticky floor. Um, and that means that uh, women and minorities tend to uh, get stuck on uh, certain positions uh, that are somewhere uh, at, the, at the lower part or in the middle of this career ladder or a pipeline, depending how you imagine. But these positions are undervalued. Uh, and uh, for various structural reasons, women uh, and uh, uh, many other minorities, people who are uh, coming from the uh, who don't are uh, who are not in position of privilege, can uh, can get stuck uh, in positions like uh, assistant teaching, a non tenured uh, position. So uh, this is one of the structural uh, 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 problems. Uh, another one is. Uh, a bottleneck at the postdoctoral level, meaning uh, that uh, we have uh, uh, also due, uh, due to uh, uh, structural changes that are also happening in Eastern Europe uh, after the end of socialism, there was abundance of postgraduate programs. And in past uh, 30 years on the global level, we are seeing a spike in the number of people who are uh, getting and finishing their uh, doctoral studies. Uh, but what happens is that, uh, of course, the research sector, both in higher education and in business, uh, but in academia in particular, uh, has a relatively limited number of of, uh, positions, especially the secured, well-paid positions, and uh, with neoliberalization uh, of academia, uh, with uh, uh, market-orientated uh, tendencies in um, uh, academic setting that we are seeing in all Eastern European and uh, post-socialist countries, uh, we can see that there uh, is um, diverse diversification of available academic posts. Uh, so the secured tenure track posts are uh, dwindling in proportion and the number of uh, precarious positions for researchers are increasing, but still even these increased uh, numbers or increasing numbers of uh, academic positions are uh, not meeting uh, uh, the, the number of people who actually get PhD, actually get uh, educated. So there is a bottleneck phenomena at the postdoctoral level where many people are uh, actually uh, uh, do not manage to continue their uh, career in academia and uh, have difficulty to obtain permanent position. There is another phenomenon that is typical for uh, uh, continental Europe and uh, for many Eastern European countries. Uh, and uh, 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 to some extent, uh, maybe a result also of the historical uh, conditions and uh, uh, and the fact that uh, our academic settings uh, have not been so dynamic uh, and uh, mobile uh, as in Anglo-Saxon uh, academic tradition. What I'm talking about is academic inbreeding. That means that a uh, university is hiring its own graduates and uh, these graduates then uh, move within one institution from the position, from the lowest position of an assistant to the highest position of a full professor uh, without actually ever leaving the institution. And uh, there is a, a sort of a hereditary relationship between mentors and mentorees where um, the future academic uh, and research staff is sort of um, uh, mobilized uh, or engaged at a very early stage and then they are uh, sort of uh, trained into becoming full professors but this is why this is called inbreeding is that the system is very often hermetic and does not 
uh, allow newcomers to enter the scene. Uh, and uh, the system of reproduction is based on uh, certain uh, cultural norms and uh, ways of doing in uh, typical for particular institution and therefore are stiff and hard to change. Uh, this is uh, this type of uh, academic uh, organization uh, has been called by some authors mandarin uh, organizations uh, because uh, the the academic mandarins is used as a symbol to name well established full professors who hold vast power and act as gatekeepers uh, for networks that are very often gendered meaning they are not excluding women, but they are functioning within uh, uh, unwritten courts uh, that some other authors have been naming uh, mobilizing masculinities or old boys club. So the informal networks of uh, getting and sharing information uh, also on the posts, on potential work and so forth, are shared with the, in a neformal way uh, among the people who are in position of power. So the this, this system is not directly uh, discriminating women, but it is producing very often gendered uh, effects uh, that uh, uh, women are harder to enter these informal networks and the longer they exist and are established, it is harder uh, for women uh, and minorities uh, to break them. Uh, uh, this is, of course, not something that we can say rules for each of your institutions that you are coming from, but has been uh, recognized as a pattern that is reoccurring in many of uh, European and especially East European countries. Um, so uh, what I have been explaining is one is, are some of the features of academia as a gendered organization. What means that an organization is gendered? It means that, um, that inequalities persist in workplaces because gender is embedded in the very system of the organization. Uh, so the, 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 that means that uh, uh, we should look at the systemic norms and what are their gender aspects, gender dimensions, uh, which are creating different kinds of norms, expectations, and opportunities for when men and women. Uh, uh, every organization has its own culture. Uh, so when we say uh, that uh, uh, what we think under organizational cult culture is uh, uh, a set of basic assumptions and beliefs shared by members of the organizations and uh, uh, they operate unconsciously and defy and are de um, and are taken for granted by people participating, being by the people who are employed as part of the organization. Uh, so all these unwritten norms, unconscious biases, expectations, all of them have uh, uh, have a gender written. Uh, in. It's never, it's not always obvious, uh, but it is, uh, we, we can see how men and women uh, have different uh, level of um, trouble fitting in into uh, gendered organizations. Um, so uh, this is, this is uh, um, the gendered organizational system subsumes uh, uh, something that we call the second generation gender bias, which means that uh, discrimination is nowadays also because of the uh, rules of political correctness are uh, uh, very rarely working in its open Form. So uh, very rarely we will face situation where women are directly discriminated as such as women. However, what is what is uh, uh, mostly experienced by women is particularly this unwritten code of, of conduct, which for which uh, women 
have a, a harder time to uh, fulfill. Um, another, so when we talk about uh, academia, another structural problem is the issue of meritocracy and excellence. Uh, meritocracy is system dictating that candidates should be uh, appointed on the basis of their merit um, and that um, it's uh, uh, based on the assumption that uh, uh, the best will win. The system is neutral and we should have um, neutral uh, uh, criteria of uh, excellence, of academic excellence uh, that uh, are, uh, that should be the only guiding principle who is at the top of academic ladder and who is below. Um, and uh, precisely uh, the principle of merit uh, and uh, scientific excellence uh, is something that is used as a key argument to those who are resisting gender equality institutional changes, saying that we don't want to, for instance, favor women because in academia, the only thing that matters is uh, the science and the quality of science. So let the best person win. However, the way we define excellent, excellence is considered to, uh, is something that is socially constructed, uh, uh, constructed. it's not neutral in itself. And uh, we all have experienced uh, in post-socialist countries how system has been changing from year after year, the criteria that you need to fulfill in order for habilitation or in order to apply for uh, national funding are changing uh, year, uh, uh, every few years. And what people are experiencing is that uh, the, the bar is setting higher, but it's also that not everybody are uh, equally able to reach this bar. So um, to illustrate how meritocratic principle may produce gender defects, I'm going to give you an example from community of practice that I am uh, coordinating in Slovenia, it's called Alt plus G. And uh, for the past two years, we have been dealing with requirements for advancement to the level of senior researcher, which are, uh, to name the few, excellent publications in the past five years, uh, three consecutive uh, months abroad and concluded mentorship. What turned out is that for many women, um, it is very hard to uh, fulfill a requirement of three consecutive months abroad in five years after their uh, doctorate, which are crucial for future advancement, precisely because these are uh, the years where most of the women actually decide to have children and family and therefore have caring duties. So the way we interfered into this system is that uh, we were trying to argue how to uh, enable uh, persons uh, to fulfill this requirement, but in different ways than they are defined by the standards of excellence. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, if a person uh, spent one year on um, maternity or paternity leave, uh, then uh, the, their uh, publications are measured not for last five years, but for last six years. So one year is added for every year uh, of uh, absence of leave. Uh, and uh, when you go into these details, how excellence is measured, then you see why it is usually harder for younger women to meet these uh, seemingly neutral requirements. Now I leave floor to uh, Lorena. Okay, yes, let's uh, move forward then. Um, and please keep on sharing your question and also share any other input, comment, materials that you think it's interesting to share, examples, okay, because there is lots of knowledge and experience in the room. So let's try to uh, to get profit of it. Okay, so all comments and and uh, uh, things that you want to share are very much appreciated. Okay, so let's um, let's move forward. Uh, we will start. We won't go through the basic concepts because you all 
mainly all of you, just like a couple of person uh, said that they didn't have um, knowledge on the topic, but most of you have the basic knowledge and know about the related concepts. So we want, we will skip that part, but please feel free to ask if anything is unclear, feel free to ask in the, in the chat box, okay? Um, let's start with this general overview, okay? We need um, a, a roadmap to show us what are the main steps and what are the, the basic keys and principles when we are starting this um, process of structural change and designing our own gender equality plan. Okay, so um, let's start. Um, I will go, just show them all please, Giovanna, because I will go very quickly through this one, uh, just because you said that you all, you are all familiar with what a gender equality plan is. So we won't go through all of this, but I would like you to stick to a one very important idea here. And is that a gender equality plan needs to include a whole set of action. If it doesn't include, if it's only um, a communication or a set of objectives, it, it will be more a kind of strategy, but not a gender equality plan. So we need to be clear on this, what a gender equality plan is not. And it, sometimes institutions, they just adopt one general strategy and they, they present that at, as a gender equality plan. So we need to know that the mere adoption of general objectives, fostering gender equality, it's important. And it's necessary, but it's not a gender equality plan. And also a broader strategy or a broader plan, including a gender dimension among others, which is also quite common, like having a diversity anti-discrimination general strategy, that is not a gender equality plan either. It is difficult, I know in some concepts, and I'm coming here, um, especially with a political context where um, we are facing really backsliding here, like in Hungary, uh, it is difficult. And it can be a strategy to say, you know, to skip the word gender, no things that suddenly you think that you won't be facing this kind of problems now. It was something that was discussed like years ago and suddenly again, it's like we cannot use, of course, I'm not talking even about feminism. I'm talking just about using the word gender. So it can be a strategy at some point to try to hide that into a diversity plan or look for a name that won't trigger that much resistances if that is your context, but still keep in mind that you need it to be focused on gender equality and not on general discriminations. So we need not to lose focus and we need it to have a set of action, okay? So uh, having said this, what are the main steps to set up a gender equality plan? This graphic represents the idea of institutional change as a process. So working for a structural change implies this uh, systemic and integrated uh, long-term uh, approach. Okay, so as we see here, the jet design have these different steps. The first, first one, of course, getting started. We will see it right now. Then gender analysis, we need to assess the state of play at our institution. Then setting up the gender equality plan. Then implementing it, which is already the fourth step. The thing is that we, we normally think that the third one is actually the first, setting up the JEP, and we have two previous steps, which are really important. Implementing would be the fourth one. And then we need uh, also to monitor and to evaluate our gender quality plan. And coming to that point, you will say, we're back at the same point, we're not. If we have done things good at some point we should be in a different position coming to this to this point and from there is uh, where we need to think okay so what is next no we uh, we need to think that the gender quality plan is not like a final station and you know whenever you have you've you've evaluated it you're done it's not like that it's a long-term process 
So we all the time need to to think about sustainability and and about what is coming next. Okay. In this training, we are going to focus on step uh, three, four, and five. Um, but still, don't worry. We will go through the key aspects of all of the steps. Or if one of you were saying in your registration form, the main checkpoints you were interested in the main checkpoints to prepare gender quality plans. So we will try um, to tackle them all. Okay. So let's um, move to the next one. Uh, it's important to know what are the success factors in these kind of processes. Okay. First, we need a comprehensive legal and policy setting, which is definitely not a self-sufficient factor. It's not going to, you know, we're not going to succeed on having our gender quality plan just because of this, but at least it will help us and it will legitimize the process. Uh, and definitely it's a, it's a really good argument. I mean, is the law we have to do it, which is, for example, the good things that we have in Spain, but it's something that in many countries is uh, lacking. Um, but however, in, in the organizational legislation and policies in three countries, there are broad anti-discrimination frames that are often used. Um, the thing is that not so many times they are focused on gender equality, but still we can use that. Then uh, we need support and formal commitment from top man uh, management, top leadership and top management positions. And we can in fact uh, say that lacking this is definitely a major risk for the process. This is a lesson learned by all the structural change process uh, and sister projects uh, that have already experienced it. So, so we need to make gender equality become a priority for top management. And luckily, the thing is that we have a whole set of arguments in the gear tool. We will give you the link to the gear tool in case you don't know uh, this tool. It's really interesting. And um, there was one of you that were uh, saying that uh, also in the expectations that you wanted to know how to convince your university to implement uh, to do a gender quality plan. So you can go to this gear tool and check all this whole set of arguments besides all the things that we are commenting uh, today, okay? Then we need to balance between this top-down and this bottom-up uh, approach. And also not only within the institution, but also combine it with an outside uh, approach, okay? We're normally very clear about the top-down, um, we know that uh, we need the engagement as much as, as possible of all the community at our university, but we also know this that we have just mentioned. We also need the commitment um, and the engagement from top uh, leadership to open the way. Otherwise, even if we have a, a clear top-down approach and we have a mass, you know, trying to push, uh, to push the gender equality forward, if we don't have also the bottom up in gender quality issues, we're going to be facing a wall and really fighting um, a long time until we get that, okay? Next one will be to have a well-equipped and supporting structures, which includes a gender quality body that uh, should be well-located within the institution and well-equipped. Um, or in the absence, if you cannot have, if you cannot have such a body, at least um, some kind of um, organized structure within the institution, like a gender quality officer or focal points, or at least a gender quality working group, something that can be formalized within the institution and that is well equipped, humanly uh, thinking in human resources. Uh, of course, economic resources, and of course, in terms of uh, time and knowledge, okay? This is also to be well equipped. Then another success factor would be having the community members uh, engagement. This is crucial for sustainability, in fact, and for appropriation. If we want people to be involved in the implementation, and not facing resistances, for example, we really need to engage them 
involved them, all the community, since the very beginning, okay? And we will need participatory methodologies for that, as we will see. And then, of course, we need uh, sufficient funding to allocate enough resources to the gender quality plan. Otherwise, we will have just a paper to sow, and, and that's it. And um, this is going to be also part of the requirements that uh, the gender quality plans have enough uh, resources, just to be clear that this is not just having this paper so we can present it and say we have a gender quality plan, okay? And next one, ah, and the last one, yes. And really important, last but not least, really important one, we need to identify and to manage um, resistances because this is definitely one of the main blockages to change and, and especially in gender issues because um, when we face uh, resistances, it will, it will deal not only with implementing a specific action, it has to do with the organizational culture and how it provides uh, within the norms, informal channels. There are many ways in which resistances can be um, shown in, in active, passive ways. We need to identify all of them. And this is going to be really crucial for the success of our gender equality plan. And also because they will show us uh, and they will help us uh, to understand the challenges that we face at our own institution and also show us at some point some opportunities even. So just not to put everything like really in a negative way. <laughs> okay, next one, please. Okay, so what are the basic principles that we should articulate our process? Okay, institutional change needs to be, first of all, as I was just uh, saying, participatory, or at least at mass, uh, at much, as much as possible, because this is what will promote the self-reflection that is needed, and that will also this self-reflection help uh, dealing with resistances. And this is what will help in defining meaningful measures for the people. If you invite them, to design the gender equality plan, it will be meaningful for them afterwards, okay? And at the same time, you are respecting the institutional culture and, and its communications, channels and everything, okay? So, and it definitely helps with uh, the people willing to implement the measures afterwards. Then it should be holistic. And what might happen if we don't have a holistic approach? is that some fundamental issues, uh, like for example, gender bias and things that Giovanna just explained, they can be just left untouched and it can be focused on just specific uh, quantitative or human resources aspects and not dealing with this whole cultural aspect. So we need this holistic approach, which means having a really comprehensive um, approach that connects all the different levels and all the different challenging issues, key issues that we have just explained, okay? Then it has to be inclusive, making here diversity a key aspect of, of our plan. And we need to include not only um, the people that we know it's important for implementing the plan, but also we need to think how to include in the process all those resistant actors to promote also their self-reflexivity and you know to, to try to make the path um, yeah a little bit more inclusive. Then intersectionality, which is also something that in Horizon Europe it's really highlighted as an important aspect. So our gender equality plan should have an intersectional approach. So what we need here is to understand how all the different um, discrimination patterns that might be operating in our institution intersect with each other and, and how um, they create uh, uh, different situations of inequalities, okay? 
And this is just allowing us to make this multi-level analysis that will help us to understand the complex relations of inequalities. Okay? Then the process needs to be visible. And this means making everything visible, the identified needs, uh, what we see in the gender assessment, but also making commitment visible. So whenever we have the top leadership commitment, great, we, we, we uh, put it on the website, we do a specific event, something that makes things visible, that will also will make it harder for them than to, to back uh, on that decision, okay, to be. Um, then we need it, we need to be flexible, an institutional change process is everything but static. It will be always changing. It is continuously evolving at any reality. And as, as any culture, we are always evolving. So the process will be evolving as well. And it will constantly need adaptations and redesign. One very clear example, what happened to us at the Universidad Complutense is that we had elections and we had a really unexpected change of the rectoral team, a completely change of priorities, and we were in the middle of the process. So we really need to be flexible uh, in the face of these kinds of situations and adapt and really look for the new windows of opportunity of the new context, okay? And then we need the process to be sustainable for which a long-term approach is needed. And we will talk about this in the last uh, step. And of course, we need it to be feminist, even if we cannot use the word, but please keep on mind that what we are talking about is power relations and gender power relations and a gendered culture in our organizations. So we really need to have to be focused on this and have this feminist approach, even if we don't use the word in the paper. Okay, that's really important. Otherwise, we won't have success. Your faces again, everything okay so far? Yeah. Yeah. Great. We Thank had you. some interesting, uh, two interesting comments uh, in chat yeah. box, and I would like to uh, address them before we move on because uh, they are uh, relevant. Uh, so uh, uh, further on, on the issue of academic inbreeding, um, to tackle uh, academic inbreeding in their gender equality plan, as I understand. Uh, however, uh, they have experienced that uh, provisions we uh, provisions we introduced in our career plan to prevent inbreeding actually complicated career growth of women, and we will be reviewing them with uh, uh, gender equality plan preparations. Uh, so it basically that doesn't matter whether this career plan was part of the initial JAP or not. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, you're doing uh, precisely what, uh, uh, what the theory, the literature is recommending, and that is uh, you create uh, a measure, you created a measure to tackle certain point, but then you have to monitor how it's implemented and how and evaluate how it's, uh, what's its actual effect is. Uh, and uh, very often measure may have a different or slightly different effect from what was initially planned. So the purpose of evaluation is not just to check whether the gender equality plan is achieving its goals, but whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, maybe producing contra effects. And here uh, maybe qualitative uh, types of um, analysis could be useful like focus groups or interviews with particular group that you are intending to help uh, as I see like young uh, uh, women and gender equality plan is was never intended to be carved in stone it is a living breeding document that basically should be revised with every uh, process of um, uh, uh, checking uh, its working. So maybe on an annual uh, basis when you are, when the institution is evaluating uh, effects of its uh, gender equality plan, it is also a good opportunity to think uh, what should be done maybe differently uh, in the next iteration, in the next version of a gender equality plan. Lorena, would you add something on this? Uh, we don't hear you. Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. No, I think that was uh, clear, but I would like to address another question. A very interesting one, in fact, if a gender policy plan should be distinct from anti-discrimination policy, but at the same time, um, it should be intersectional. Can you elaborate on that? How you understand the intersectionality of the gender equality plan then? And how is it different from anti-discrimination policy? So this is this is really a key question in, and really interesting. First thing is that, of course, um, distinct, it doesn't mean to be excluding one and another. I mean, it's interesting that you have in fact, many institutions do have this EDI, this uh, equality, diversity, um, uh, institutional plans or, or policies. But then this is more a kind of institutional declaration or strategy, and it's not exactly a gender equality plan. So they are not excluding one another, but they are, should be complementary. And the key thing here is that um, intersectionality uh, what it needs to be is the key analytical framework of our gender equality plan. Um, so it was is this is what will help us uh, talk about the different interlocking systems of power and, and oppressions, so that we are clear that we're not talking just about um, the predominant white uh, middle class female scholar, and that we take into account all the different profiles and situations um, in our universities. And also it will help us not talking also about the different um, uh, situations affecting women, but of course to talk also about the privilege uh, regarding men and the different uh, privilege and profiles also within uh, that part. So the thing is what, um, what I wanted to make clear is that um, and I recommend you to see this Mick Everloo um, webinar that you can find on the um, uh, Gender Equality Academy um, channel, YouTube channel. It's really interesting. And what Mick Everloo says, also there is a paper of Mick Everloo with Emanuela Lombardo, very interesting on this, uh, uh, on this aspect. And they say that in processes where uh, gender equality is bent toward some other goals, like wider goals can have uh, particularly critical consequences because these kind of processes where we bend gender equality to some other goals, what uh, implies is that in the end they depoliticize the issue of gender equality and thus not, not representing gender equality as the key political aspect to be addressed. And, and having gender relations as the key political aspect to be addressed. And this is the different. Having a gender equality plan is what will, um, uh, uh, will ensure having this focus on this gender relation, power relation on the core of it. And then of course, we, can, we, we need to have the intersectional approach, not to forget all the different uh, oppression system intersecting here. So intersectionality would be um, the analytical framework, but the, the gender equality and gender power relations need to be the focus. So that I don't know if that was clear enough, but uh, that would be the, the difference. So they're not excluding uh, each other, okay? I the, agree. Uh, add to what Lorena has said is that, um, what makes difference in the sense of content between the issue of gender equality and the issue of anti-discrimination is maybe the proactive um, quality that gender equality plans have. So they don't only prevent discrimination, but they are doing a, a positive sort of discrimination, positive action uh, that wants to address particular deeply culturally and historically ingrained injustices that are printed into the way we understand uh, science and we do science and educate uh, younger generations. So it is about changing culture, 
the the element of of uh, academic culture that is uh, related to gender. Um, so this is maybe what is a uh, quality. So uh, the beneficiaries of a gender equality plan are therefore not only women, but also uh, young male researchers who are um, do who are um, performing and living different type of masculinity than the traditionally that one traditionally understood. So um, men who are taking on caring duties, uh, uh, who are using their paternity leaves and so on. Uh, the gender equality plan tends to enable them and accommodate them within academic system, not to allow um, the present situation in which you are in a way uh, punished by uh, being uh, anything else than just uh, dedicated to, to your work. Uh, so start with getting started. Yeah. <laughs> Lorena, please. Okay, so yeah, let's go to it. Please, next, next slide. Okay. Um, after getting this general picture, of the process, uh, we are already in the first uh, step. How do we start? This was also one question, something that was noted in the registration form. No? Um, how to start with everything? Okay, first, key aspect, uh, context matter. Okay, this is the first crucial aspect. The plan should be tailored to fit your own institutional and, and local conditions and context. So understanding your institutional context would be the first re requirement for a successful plan, okay? The, um, and this includes thinking about its history and its legacies, as we saw, um, things like its size, its areas of specializations, its structure, whether you are in a more vertical or horizontal, or if it's very hierarchical institution, um, and of course, it's culture as we're talking. So uh, take into account uh, this. You cannot just copy and paste a, a plan from one institution to another. It won't work if you don't adapt it to your context, okay? The next one would be to do a map of factors. And um, this, this aspect, mapping the actors in your institutions and the stakeholders highlights the importance um, of change agents. So we need to ask ourselves what people might be key um, in the process. People that, and not only people in power position and experts and enthusiasts, but people from whom we can learn something, things like that. So answering this question, it's really interesting. It's the, one of the first questions we need to ask ourselves and it will imply the recognition of the multiplicity of knowledges and experiences. And we need to be inclusive. This is one of our principles, how to include all these different knowledges in the process, okay? Um, then we need to identify potential allies within this map of actors. And this is really important. And this is also one lesson learned to not to focus all our energies in trying to convince the resistant people, but building rather focus on building identifying and building strong nets with our allies which in fact will help us dealing with resistances then we need to strategically choose agent um, change agents um, and from this map of factors we constitute what would be our core team uh, throughout the the whole process and what we need to do here is um, to assess our capabilities of these change agents so we can think of a specific training and a specific, uh, specific capacities and abilities and knowledge that we still lack and look for more allies or, or, or we look um, how to solve this lack of knowledge or of attitudes. It's, it's not capabilities, it's not only about uh, knowledge, but also we need enthusiast people and people with ability, with the ability to negotiate, for example, things like that, okay? Then network, and we need to, to build networks 
at national and also at uh, international levels with other institutions, with other European projects, at regional, uh, at, at all different levels. And this was, um, in fact, this was mentioned in, in another training precisely by a participant from a CEE country that uh, she was saying that in fact for them, it was this, um, she was highlighting the need for partnering with European institutions uh, to look for far, uh, foreign fundings to implement their gender equality plan. And that was their main strategy. So this can be really a success factor, okay? Then we need uh, to consider and to find uh, funding and resources, of course. You can do this either at European level or by similar initiative uh, that you might have available at national or regional uh, level. In fact, the EU funding, as we saw, is one of the main external factors with capacity to, to trigger uh, this kind of, of processes. Um, but however, it's also interesting to check because in C countries, uh, they rarely appear, uh, these institutions rarely appear among the gender quality plans um, struct and structural change process in Horizon 2020 uh, among the different partners. So maybe it's time to trigger and to foster this in this new Horizon Europe and, and build these, these European networks. Then we need to get support from decision makers. We just said, this is a general success factor, getting top level commitments. And then we need to clarify a mandate. Uh, mandate. And this uh, means not only that we have a clear mandate from the institution saying that, uh, we are in charge of uh, designing the gender equality plan, but also to have it publicly endorsed or, or having the formal um, political and decision maker, uh, makers support and to make it visible as we, as, as we said, okay? Uh, this is more or less our first step. This is also related to one of your expectations. Some of you were asking uh, how to begin the work on gender equality plan at my university as your main expectation. So this would be the first steps. The other day in this GECO target uh, conference that uh, was held last week, there was one participant that said it was uh, just three steps. And she was saying, if you want to start the process, uh, just um, start the conversation, gather some data and challenge it all. So that would be the starting point, okay? Regarding the uh, specificity of and the importance of map of, of actors, I will give the floor to Giovanna to explain the couple of techniques for that one. Yes, thank you. So uh, what uh, is very important at the start of a gender equality plan is to, uh, to map actors at your institution. Uh, basically, uh, one person cannot do it, even if he or she is uh, the greatest gender equality expert in the world. Institutional change demands co-working uh, co of people with knowledge, uh, working together with people who are in position to implement changes, and working together with people who are in power to change something. So at the beginning, we usually advise to map actors within your institutions and uh, as part of uh, your team uh, or your core team that is dedicated or set a name to uh, create gender equality plan should probably start with this interactive activity. It's a, participatory activity that can be done in different ways. Uh, on the left side, we are showing one, uh, uh, one methodology that you can do online or on a meeting uh, uh, in live, uh, and that is mapping stakeholders by level of inclusion into gender equality plan implementation. So to define who are the people that we have in core team who are dedicated uh, personally and professionally to creating gender equality plan uh, and uh, then to see who uh, should be members of the steering group. Usually here you need uh, people from the two 
different groups that I mentioned before, somebody in position of power and somebody in position to um, implement it. So you need a support and involvement of a support staff at your university. So don't think only that can that researchers can do a lot of things. You need uh, cooperation of people from uh, human resources management and so forth. Uh, and uh, then think uh, about who is your wider network of individuals within your institutions. This might be student councils uh, in a big university or um, uh, or uh, people that are working on uh, in PR uh, service of your institution. If, uh, for instance, um, uh, you realize that part of your gender equality plan needs to be promotion of female scientists or some kind of uh, uh, raising awareness campaign, then you need these kind of ex experts within or outside of your institution to get involved at certain point of gender equality plan. Another way to map actors is what we uh, shown on the right side, and that is a map of stakeholders when you are organizing uh, stakeholders, putting them on board, uh, depending on power they have to foster change uh, and resistance or support to change. Uh, so resistance uh, can be also presented as uh, positive and negative, or for instance, support to change could be lesser or smaller. So it is important to be aware uh, whether uh, your map is consisted of mostly people who have a lot of enthusiasm but don't have much of power, then you realize, aha, uh -huh, this is our risk area and we should uh, think how to manage it. Uh, or that uh, you have um, uh, that you have people who support the gender early gender equality plan, you have them on board, but they are not really very engaged or they have particular resistances to gender ideology or mentioning feminism or so forth, then this is something you have to bear in mind in further steps of uh, developing gap. Now we are moving on to step two, uh, which is uh, institutional gender analysis. So at the beginning, before you have a plan, you have to first figure out what is the problem in your institution. And if you are, um, uh, uh, whatever is the way that uh, you are uh, starting to think what is the potential problem at your institution, whether you have some pilot survey or you conducted a survey among employees, or you have some general knowledge, as we said, about the typical issues that uh, are causing gender inequalities in the institution, you have to think that each of these problems could be, uh, for each of these problems, we need different types of data. So for instance, when uh, we are thinking about uh, removing gender related institutional barriers uh, to careers of women, uh, we need to collect data uh, desegregated by sex about uh, women at different stages of their careers, then we probably would get need to have get some data about that are reflecting a uh, rate of success uh, among men and women within particular institution. What may turn up, uh, turn out is that uh, so you need not only data that exist, but you also need to look for the data that are absent from the typical reports uh, that institution gathers, but they might be available to you. So uh, first step is to identify what data your institution is already collecting and then to put them together. Very often institutions are already collecting data about their employees for various reasons, from uh, you know, uh, paying taxes to uh, conducting, uh, you know, to providing data for uh, she figures collection and so forth. However, not always these data are mutually comparable. 
uh, or uh, are desegregated by sex. Uh, so this is, for instance, what we found out at our institution, that our institution uh, research center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts is collecting a lot of data about their researchers, but they, and they uh, do have separate data for men and women, but generally this desegregation by sex is not considered relevant for most of the analysis that have been done before we embarked on gender equality plan. So the first step was to put together the data that already exists and then to see whether it has gender dimension and then use that gender dimension in, uh, uh, in comparison of different types of data. Then, uh, as I said uh, on the example of uh, removing institutional barriers to career, uh, or for instance, gender balance in decision making, you need to identify also the data that you don't have, but you need to collect. So for instance, um, you might have data or you might, uh, uh, so for instance, uh, you, each institution has data lists of members of uh, different important decision-making bodies, but the institution is not systematically analyzing the gender balance of these decision-making bodies. So uh, the part of uh, uh, the part of the problem, so the, the, the task here would be to task somebody from uh, the supporting staff of the institution to go through already existing data and then create or get information that are missing to put all pieces of the puzzle together. Then uh, you should identify pos possible sources of information and techniques to collect data. So uh, maybe some sources of uh, information are already there. Uh, for instance, uh, at the statistical bureau of your country or at the agency, uh, national agency for scientific funding uh, or uh, habilitation uh, agencies that are in charge of accreditation and habilitation processes, they might get some, have some relevant data, for instance, comparable for the whole of country that could inform you whether your institution is above or below average of, uh, let's say, uh, women among young researchers uh, or uh, women among researchers who got a certain type of scholarship uh, or stipend and further on. Uh, then you should also think of different ways, different techniques of collecting data. We will talk about that further on. Uh, then uh, a necessary part, when we are talking about data, we are now, we were just talking about data connected with one institution, but it is the part of the data is also to know relevant re legislation and policies, uh, part of uh, that are uh, national legislation, that are uh, maybe legislation that has nothing to do with gender equality, but is relevant for you. So you should be uh, informed about uh, relevant legislation and regulatives uh, relating to higher education, research and development, uh, then social protection, uh, everything that relates to uh, working relation, anti-discrimination and so on. You probably do have that kind of knowledge within your institution. If you are gender equality, you know, a gender scholar or, uh, uh, or uh, IT scholar who is just interested in gender equality, of course, you might not be personally familiar with it. This is why you need, for instance, legal office as part of your uh, map of actors, uh, somebody to provide you information and help you in uh, navigating through uh, legislation. Um, and once you collected all these data, you should, uh, of course, correlate them and analyze them. So uh, possible techniques uh, that have been mentioned are uh, the administrative data. As I said, every institution is already uh, usually 
required by different types of legislation to collect data for different types of purposes. Of course, until now, most institutions haven't thought that uh, they need to collect its data for gender equality purposes, but then um, this is data that you usually already have, but you have to put them together. Then think about conducting interviews with a representative um, a sample of the target groups that you um, uh, noted that, uh, that uh, you need to tackle or address in your gender equality plan. So usually it's good to do interviews with women at different stages of their career. So uh, with young women, for instance, at the beginning uh, of uh, academic ladder to see uh, what kind of uh, challenges uh, they are facing and uh, uh, elder women or women at the higher uh, positions uh, to see how, uh, what is their uh, uh, experience uh, or that accumulated over uh, decades. Uh, a good um, methodology is also focus group, which is basically interviewing a group of people at the same time, uh, giving each of them uh, uh, some uh, fair share of time to express their feelings. A good thing about focus group uh, is uh, that people tend to inspire, trigger, provoke one another, and then you get more diverse uh, information about one phenomenon than you would have uh, just by interviewing one or the same number of individuals that you have in focus groups. Focus groups are best organized if you have eight to 12 individuals, not more than that. Uh, in focus groups, you should be aware that people might not be open enough to talk about very intimate or maybe even traumatic experiences uh, of uh, discrimination they, they experienced uh, in their working life in that organization. Uh, a good way to maybe get this kind of uh, sensitive information in a larger population is a questionnaire. Um, uh, I know that uh, your uh, Polish community of practice has been uh, translating uh, a GAM tool, a gender equality audit and monitoring tool that has been developed as part of ACT uh, project. And I'm hoping that uh, this questionnaire uh, will be used at different stages of implementation gender equality plan. So, you can use questionnaire to get initial data uh, in order to uh, define what kind of uh, gender equality measures you want to implement. Uh, but then uh, a questionnaire is also a good way to evaluate and measure success of your gender equality plan. Then uh, what we did, for instance, uh, uh, in our institution was ethnographic methods, observations. For instance, uh, we were uh, looking at uh, certain promotional events uh, organized uh, by our institution to raise awareness uh, and share knowledge that we are conducting at our institution. And then we try to, uh, uh, to analyze this subtle uh, gendered ways of uh, promoting science in which very often science is promoting in a way that is fitting a much more masculine uh, image of a scientist than the feminine one. And then this, these information were then reflected on how we can use them to uh, create a particular measure that would break this uh, unconscious bias that we noted within our institution. Uh, a good way is also to organize workshops uh, with the different stakeholders, either with the uh, uh, key beneficiaries that gender equality plan should uh, tackle. So for instance, um, to, um, to gather young researchers and uh, to uh, talk with them about particular problem uh, and for instance to analyze it through cause diagram that I'm showing uh, that is basically uh, uh, stimulating this methodology stimulating people to think of 
direct causes of a certain problem, for instance, uh, why so little, why women need twice more time to um, step from one level uh, of academic advancement to another. Uh, and then uh, to think about direct and indirect causes and uh, co factors uh, that are contributing that are not uh, necessarily um, related to gender, uh, but are relevant for, uh, for instance, uh, increased competition uh, for national funding. Uh, I already explained uh, stakeholder mapping, which is another good uh, technique of uh, 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 collecting data from different persons in the form of a workshop and of course SWOT analysis that most of you are familiar with. What we are advising is to mix different methods, mix different type of data and uh, to be as participatory as possible. Uh, now, uh, I'm just uh, uh, asking Lorena if we have any interesting questions in the chat before we move on. Uh, uh, we have just two people that were adding information to what you were saying, explaining about the GIAM tool, and they placed the link there. So thank you for that. That's great. And no other questions. So we can move forward. Thank and you. Go Thank you, Jovan, and go already into um, step three. This is, this is an important step. And the main reason, not only because it will define how your gender equality plan will look like, but uh, um, this is a practical tip. And bear in mind, this is also lesson learned by other structural change projects. Sometimes when you're already implementing your JEP, you suddenly realize that what you're dealing with is a problem that is actually a design problem. So this is really an important step, okay? Take this into account. So let's go into it and let's see what are the elements, uh, the basic elements of every gender equality plan, okay? The basic actions to take into consideration when we set up our gender equality plan. First thing is that, of course, we need to get inspiration. We are saying that context matters and that's key, but of course it's, it's important to get inspirations from measures implemented by other organizations, other gender quality plans and so on, but make sure to adapt them uh, and all these objectives and measures to our uh, specificities and to our own context, okay? Uh, so having said that, uh, just don't copy, get inspiration, but don't, don't copy paste. What do we need? We need to define the general and the specific objectives of our plan based on the analysis uh, done. And they, uh, they should cover these five recommended basic domains that uh, we were talking about. Remember the uh, work-life balance, uh, gender equality in career, in decision-making, gender equality in research uh, and in teaching and uh, sexual and sexist harassment, okay? They should cover at least uh, these five areas recommended. Um, then once we have our objectives, we need uh, to define the actors to be involved, okay? Um, ah, sorry, and for, I jumped. Uh, for each objective, we need to define at least one measure of re, uh, regarding institutional change, okay? Uh, and at least one per objective should be more, but at least one, okay? Otherwise, if we don't have measures and, and specific actions, as we said before, we cannot consider that to be a proper gender equality plan, okay? Maybe a statement, a strategy, but not a gender equality plan, okay? Um, so what are the basic requirements here? Our actions, our measures should be uh, based on this empirical problem that we have just analyzed with our gender analysis. It should address at least one of the five objectives that we, as we said, explicitly address them. Uh, it needs to um, formulate precise targets and, and target groups and take uh, intersectionality into account here. And um, 
they need to be, of course, subject to monitoring and evaluation. So we need to develop indicators for each one, okay? So um, key aspect here, this thing of, what does it mean, this thing into in brackets of institutional change? It means that we should design our measures adopting a structural change perspective. And this is a fixed institution approach. So we need to avoid this traditional fix the women uh, approach, um, or which is based on this deficit model perspective as if it was just a problem of women that they need to be empowered and things like that. Okay, so we need to, to make sure that we are focusing on fixing the institution and not the other way around. Okay, and we need to be clear that we need to include different types of, of actions. You have for getting inspiration, you have a whole set of examples and a whole set of actions that I recommend you to check in the GEAR tool. Okay, so go there because you have really lots of them. But the important things is that we need to make sure that we have not only sensibilization, sensitization measures and soft measures, but that we also include some disruptive uh, measures. Okay, this is important. And the thing is that the experience in CE countries is that these soft measures are widespread, things like awareness raising and trainings and, uh, you know, like just the declarations of being committed and things like that. But at the same time, these uh, hard targeted measures like uh, quotas, compulsory training, for example, for decision makers, um, things like that are more rare or many times absent. So we need to be clear that we need all kinds of, of measures, okay? Um, taking into account that, of course, should be adapted. And one of you were also um, asking, in, um, stating in the expectations that um, um, she wanted to know about the most effective measures uh, to enable structural change. We have no answer for that. It's we don't have the most effective ones as the good ones and the less effective ones or bad ones. It will depend on the context. Um, it will uh, depend on the resources you have, because some um, some measures that maybe were very successful in some uh, institution they required a lot of of funding or a lot of human resources or whatever, and you don't have that. So you try to implement the measure and you will fail. So you need to take into account all the different aspects that we have been talking about, and you won't have a successful one or a best measure to implement. You will need to design them according to your analysis and your own context and design it in a participatory way. And that is the successful measure, the one that is designed from uh, the inside and in a participatory way, because as we were saying, people will be willing to implement those measures that they were in if they were involved in designing it. So that is the successful factor for the for a effective measure, I would say. Um, then uh, we need to think about the actors to be involved in its uh, measure, and we need to define who is going to be responsible for, for execution, execution. We need to agree on the responsibilities for each measure and for each person or each unit, not uh, specifically a person, sometimes a unit or a department or a vice rectorate, whatever, okay? So an agreement needs to be made on the, um, on the team that, that it's going to be involved in the implementation of a gender equality plan, okay? So remember your map of actors here and define who is going to do that and when. So we need to um, set also uh, a, a realistic time frame and say who and when uh, is going to, to be done, no? that, that specific uh, measure. And then, of course, resource uh, resources needed. We need to identify leverage and, and all the resources needed, including, and this is also a tip, um, look at the existing resources within your institution and not only for external funding. Look at what is going on uh, when you're planning the measures. Um, and that way we can use 
all the resources available within and outside the institution, okay? And this means, of course, financial resources, but also human resources, but also other resources like data collection procedures, uh, like existing policies, existing services with whom we can collaborate, um, knowledge that we have available in our institution, communication tools already in place that we can use. These are, these are also important resources, okay? Um, and in fact, building on existing resources is what will promote institutionalization, which is a key factor for sustainability, okay? Um, so that's it. We are going to propose to go uh, into participatory dynamic now, Giovanna. You want to yes. Yeah. So what we are going to do now is that we will divide you into breakout rooms. Uh, One thing, but just about the methodology, because I think it's also interesting that you can uh, use these these kind of methodologies within your institution. And the good thing about this Lotus Blossom, it is is that. Um, it is really well organized as to easily facilitate uh, the, the starting of that, of that discussion needed. No? So it, it's really a good tool to implement it with your own teams or with the core teams or with a, a specific uh, people within your institution and put them together to think about that. Um, and, and you can really come to to really good ideas to directly be placed into the gender quality plans. I mean, it is supposed just to start the conversation and get like the, the first uh, brainstorming on gender ideas, but sometimes really from this exercise, you can just uh, write it as an objective, like in group two, it, it is almost an objective already, the solution that you presented, like assure gender balance in, in management bodies, that can be directly translated into an objective within your gender quality plan. It is, um, it, it is specifying what you want to achieve. It is specifying the target group uh, that uh, it's supposed to address. Um, so sometimes this exercise is, is really, really productive in that way. And also it helps because it uh, not only gives you formal actions to be placed into the gender quality plans, but sometimes it also gives you ideas for your own personal strategy as a team. So sometimes one of the activities to be done related to one solutions, maybe you cannot place that directly into the gender quality plan, but you can use it as a uh, um, team's roadmap within the structural change process. So it gives you uh, not only the formal um, structure of the plan, but also the informal ways and paths towards structural change. Sometimes you cannot place directly the action, but you just keep them all and it will help you to build the or to draw the general uh, path towards, towards change. So it's really useful. Just wanted to stress that out. And also then it's very nice that you most of you uh, were balancing these soft measures with really nice uh, structural change ones and disruptive measures. So, yeah, thank you, Great Lorena, work. for this uh, uh, clarification. Uh, I think it could be summed up: a lot of blossom enables to uh, physically deconstruct complex problems um, at the very beginning. Thank you for which is actually implementing gender equality plan. So the first step was uh, preparation, then gender analysis, then setting up gender equality plan as a document. And now we are at the point where we are supposed to implement it. Now, what are the key things that we have to think of in the process of implementation of gender equality plan? Uh, first, um, Gender equality plan as such is an ad hoc measure. So it's something that institutions do at the point when they realize they have systematically to embark on changes that will uh, be supportive of gender equality. 
in its essence, it's, it's, uh, it's a temporal document, a document, a plan that has its ending point. However, the aim of gender equality plan is to instigate a long-term uh, changes, long-term effects, per particularly for special groups that have been marginalized in previous uh, periods, and to change and shift organizational culture within the institution and hopefully the whole academic field. So it is very important to embed and institutionalize as many measures as possible. So when we are thinking, for instance, uh, about a GAM survey uh, that uh, we will use at the inception phase uh, of uh, gathering primary data for our gender equality plan. What is good to think is uh, the ways in which we can include, for instance, that questionnaire into annual evaluation uh, of the institution. Uh, make it, turn it into an annual or biannual event for your employees, and then keep this data in one place where you can systematically, for instance, follow the progress. This is good not only for evaluating, measuring the effects of gender equality plan, but it, uh, the, the, the whole aim of, uh, of JEP would be to, to transform, to, to put new measures into already existing institutional structure uh, or to transform already existing practices uh, such as annual evaluation of researchers or, um, or uh, meet and retreat events uh, that are already organized within the institution. The point is to find a way to think of these measures, not as uh, something you will do only for the purpose of gender equality plan, but the idea is to embed them into uh, regular working of the institution. And more importantly, uh, to involve persons who are otherwise not seeing themselves as gender equality experts or officers, but are, for instance, um, you know, doing uh, uh, some other types of uh, bureaucratic administrative support work at the institution, embed, uh, involve their already existing activities with the measures that you are planning with the gender equality plan, and in that way, the the plan, the, the JAP, even after its ending, becomes the part of institutional structure. Uh, important moment, important step in implementing uh, the GAP is to organize regular meetings uh, of uh, the core team and the implementing team and uh, the network when necessarily. Uh, so the implementation team needs to uh, organize, uh, to meet regularly for two reasons. First, um, uh, especially at the very beginning of a gender equality plan implementation, uh, this is a, a, a project like any other project. It is uh, structured around uh, concrete uh, activities, measures that are time bound and should be delivered in particular way uh, by responsible person until concrete deadline. Therefore, um, regular meetings will help core and implementation team function more smoothly, especially bearing in mind that implementation of a JAP uh, demands involvement of a range of di diverse actors like uh, uh, administrative support staff, gender experts, and maybe you know heads of departments that have nothing to do with gender as a topic. Uh, these are the people who generally don't work uh, on regular basis with each other. Maybe they don't even meet on the corridors of the building. Uh, maybe don't, they don't even know each other from before. So regular meetings are also important for um, creating sense of community. 
uh, a small community of practice within one institution. And here we are coming to the second point why it's important to have regular meetings of implementation team. Every meeting of this kind is also an opportunity for raising awareness about gender equality or gender inequality issues. Um, as we, uh, as you realized in your working groups, um, uh, in the discussions uh, uh, before the lunch break, um, there is a, a lot of to be done in uh, just creating and building awareness and then creating and building some concrete practical knowledge that goes hand in hand with such an awareness about gender equality issues. This is not something that uh, comes to people naturally or uh, happens over a month, uh, or is something that could be uh, you know, read in a toolbox or in a scientific paper, and after that you, you understand everything. Uh, the, it is constant process of, uh, uh, knowledge exchange between the people who maybe have um, theoretical and practical knowledge on gender equality, but don't have experience of institutional uh, change reform. And then you have people who are working their whole lives in the administra administration of a university. They know the institution inside out, but they generally don't lack understanding on what is the whole point of what is the difference between sex and gender and why is this relevant for them. These two types of people need a place for sharing. So this is also why um, regular meetings are important. And uh, regular meetings are also important uh, with senior management and leadership who are not necessarily, um, they don't necessarily need to be involved in day-to-day -day activities of implementation of JAP and very often they are not. But what uh, has been noted in the practice is that very often there is declarative or even genuine support of a dean, director, head of institution uh, at the beginning of implementation of GAP. But then, um, but then this commitment is sort of uh, forgotten or uh, what I want to say is that it needs to be reinvigorated. So uh, very often we, in the process of institutional change, uh, the core team for JAMP implementation needs to coordinate and need support of the top leadership of the institution, but also of the middle management, heads of departments, uh, heads of uh, different administrative services. And uh, they might not be personally committed to gender equality plan uh, to equal measure. So what we need is also to have these regular meetings with different layers of decision makers uh, in order to remind them of their commitment, to remind them why is this important, uh, to remind them uh, that uh, they have leverage in this process and they should, should use their position of power in order to push certain things uh, or certain processes that came to, the, to a stalemate. Further on, as has be, Lorena uh, has uh, pointed earlier on, but this is uh, also important at this stage of uh, gap implementation, give visibility to the gap. So uh, distribute gap when it is accepted as an official document. Put it, so distribute it through all channels of communication with uh, the employees, put it on a public spot on the website, inform people that it exists. But also each time you reach a milestone uh, in gap implementation or after six months, one year, two years of gap implementation, you as a core team uh, should take a position, uh, uh, make it visible. Uh, 
make it visible to the employees and also to different layers of uh, management who might not be directly involved with uh, JAP implementation. On one hand, uh, this is showing what has been done. It might be showing already some concrete improvements. It's building a larger coalition of support among the employees of the institution. And it's reminding newcomers in the institution that we have gender equality plan in place and that there are bodies and persons responsible for certain uh, measures, certain activities that have gender equality as their aim. Further on, important in implementation of the gap, as I said before, think that gap is living and breathing document. So gap, uh, JAP is uh, a document that is open to constant adaptation and amendment transformation, depending on the feedback that you get from the field. Uh, so if you are conducting uh, monitoring after one year and you get information, uh, you, you, you uh, you get data that is showing you a uh, lack of progress that you were expecting, then go back to the measure and think uh, how you can check whether the measure is working the way you want, whether it's achieving the beneficiaries the way you expected, or whether it's producing some unwanted results and therefore you need to transform, rethink and change the measure that is written in the gender equality plan. An important part of implementing the gap is to identify and manage both risks and resistances. So don't shy away from the potential problem but face them directly on. And if you're sensing potential risk or a resistance, act proactively. So if you are considering that there might be uh, an uncooperative uh, element in the chain of decision making, uh, invest time and energy into persuasion, uh, negotiation with the, with the, this person or this um, uh, department of your institution. So instead of uh, trying to avoid problems, the, the, the whole point of implementing the gap is facing the problem and then uh, solving them hands, uh, hands on. Um, further. Mm -hmm. This brings us to the main or typical risks and common obstacles that, uh, uh, that uh, people come uh, to experience while implementing gender equality plan. The, the very common one is lack of support from the leadership. Uh, this is something that we should be aware of. Uh, even if you have a supportive leadership at the time of uh, gap adoption, uh, you might, the, uh, the, the leadership may change and you might face uh, a new leadership that is less uh, friendly. Another typical uh, uh, risk is lack of funding and absent absence of adequate resources. This is also what uh, happens uh, when um, gender equality plans are developed as part of European project. And uh, uh, we end the project with the gender equality plan in place, uh, but uh, without uh, pro people or without time of the people who have capacity to do it, but don't have time to keep it going and actually implement gender equality plan. This is time and uh, this is time consuming um, activity and the institution should be aware of that. And the core team needs to think about the time as a resource, even if you don't have um, competence uh, within or all the competencies that you need. Uh, again, it is a time and money uh, issue in the sense you either pay somebody from outside to provide you a type of analysis that you cannot do within 
in, in your house, or you need to find additional staff or uh, release uh, uh, part of time of the existing staff in order to dedicate uh, to the JAP related activities. Uh, uh, one of the big risks uh, is a lack of institutionalization, meaning that uh, uh, that uh, gender equality plan is created and then remains just an ad hoc activity that uh, five years after its creation is not part of the institutional written and unwritten practices. This is very important to think about institutionalization, not only as formal procedure, but also as informal practices that are taken for granted as a rule within one institution. So JAP needs to become part of these formal and informal institutional mechanisms. Then uh, you should think that the, you might have very supportive top leadership, but the, the key resistance might be at the intermediate level, either at the level of heads of department uh, or, or head of a, a research uh, group, research programs, or head of administrative units within the institution. And then you have to think how to use uh, top down and bottom up pressure to mitigate uh, this uh, mid-level resistance. Uh, another typical organizational uh, resistance is the one that uh, um, bureaucracy, administrative apparatus within the institution uh, is seeing itself as gender blind or um, what we have talked previously, the, the notions of uh, excellence and how we measure it, which are embedded in the functioning of the, uh, of the academic institution, are considered to be gender blind or neutral. And therefore, uh, any intervention in this field is considered uh, uh, to be some um, mendeling uh, that is an illegitimate, uh, not, uh, not, not okay, not in the spirit of, of science and objectivity. So you have to think how you will uh, address this risk. Then um, what we have talked uh, in the uh, morning uh, uh, session, we also, you have to think uh, how to tackle the risks uh, that uh, gendered character of scientific culture is maybe not reflected in your community. So what might be very uh, obvious to you that uh, uh, the, the masculine, typically mas when we say scientist, we imagine white middle-aged uh, man uh, dressed in a white uh, lab gown. Uh, and this is, when we say scientists, this is the psychological image that is created in our mind. Actually, majority of uh, researchers might be younger women sitting in front of their computers and not sitting in a lab. So how to break this very often unreflected, un uh, gendered uh, underlying base assumption is something that is a risk that you have to think of. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, also um, another common risk that we basically already mentioned is to um, how to negotiate principles of gender equality and uh, everything that it subsumes with very strong competitive and meritocratic culture uh, that academia is. Uh, this is a big challenge and something that uh, implementers of gender equality plan has to think of. Now, we will go to another uh, group work. We are coming to very practical and sometimes uh, the most tricky uh, part of uh, implementation uh, of gender equality plan, which is uh, also very important for its sustainability and uh, long-term institutionalization. Um, so 
the key aspect that you have to think when we are at the step of monitoring and evaluation is to understand that this is not just uh, two names for one thing. There is a difference. Monitoring means following the execution of uh, gender equality plan implementation. Uh, so um, it is a, a, a responsibility on, uh, on part uh, that is given to individual persons. This is why the uh, important part in, in gender equality plan is to um, delegate uh, exact responsibilities to exact individuals uh, within the exact uh, time frame, uh, and uh, then to uh, also identify who will monitor them and be um, in position uh, uh, to uh, to control whether what has been promised is being done. On the other hand, evaluation is uh, basically. Um, the process of establishing uh, whether the plan is uh, uh, producing the intended effects and what unintended effects it may be producing and how to uh, make it uh, work better. So um, the, these are the, the, this is the difference between the two notions. The, as I said, both procedure or protocol for monitoring and evaluation should be embedded in the gap, in the timelines and in the division, delegation and division of responsibility among the individuals in the gap. So it should be uh, either part of the, of the document itself or, um, or somehow included in the systemic chart if uh, gender equality plan is organized more uh, as a table. Um, then uh, for both monitoring and evaluation, certain level of gender expertise is needed, uh, either by um, uh, raising competencies of the staff that you have, or sometimes institutions decide uh, that for the evaluation purpose, it is good to have an outside eye. This is also a solution, but it usually uh, costs some, um, some money. However, um, the point is that uh, both monitoring and evaluation are done with genuine gender lenses. So it's um, the, the person who is, or the team, who is uh, doing uh, monitoring and evaluation should not be satisfied just by uh, gender equality plan meeting uh, its uh, goals or meeting its uh, concrete objectives, but it rather should be uh, measured with, uh, with eyes of an expert who is thinking whether we are uh, by reaching concrete objective, whether we are reaching an overarching goal of uh, uh, um, uh, raising a level of gender equality. Um, both monitoring and evaluation should be connected with uh, step two, and that is with baseline analysis of the institution. Uh, as I mentioned before, if you are conducting a survey as a preparatory activity for gender equality plan, then you should have the same type of questions included in the monitoring, uh, in the evaluation process. Uh, so you can compare the answers, for instance, before and three years or five years after. So um, even though evaluation comes at the end of uh, time, scope of uh, gender equality plan, it should be uh, think thought of at the very beginning of, um, uh, of creating GAP. Um, and um, basically monitoring and evaluation means that we establish indicators, targets and follow-up instruments through which we will um, measure um, uh, whether the, the objective has been met uh, and um, through which we will um, 
help this transformation of gap from ad hoc to institutionalized set of measures. Uh, the gender equality structures uh, that are created uh, uh, within, so through creation of gender equality plan and its implementation, in a way you are building uh, a new structure or modifying already existing structure in the, uh, in, within the institution. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's like creating a small community of practice within the institution itself. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, group of people and knowledge they are sharing and exchanging is, is the pool, the, the resource of, for both monitoring and evaluation. The point is not to hire just somebody from outside to tell us whether we did a good work, but to embed activities that are constantly checking whether we are doing a good work into the regular organizational practices of the institution. <clears throat> so uh, I think I already explained what monitoring is. Um, so monitoring is also a good way to identify uh, potential sources of resistance, especially if they are a silent one. When we have uh, 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 people within the institution who are uh, vocally opposing um, certain measures uh, or the whole uh, uh, gender equality principle or gender theory as the conservatives uh, likes to refer to them. This is something that can be tackled in one way, but it is completely different thing when you have a subtle silent resistance, uh, a sabotage within the institution uh, through neglect or lack of care or uh, lack of commitment. So the monitoring of activities and uh, that will enable you to uh, recognize which activities are not moving uh, in the attendant pace uh, by so not moving fast enough or fast as planned and then this information is uh, the information that you get through monitoring by checking and then figuring out that uh, there is a, a stalemate in uh, change process. It gives you double information. One is uh, that um, maybe you uh, set the, the bar too high. Maybe uh, the target should be changed and transformed. Uh, uh, maybe the, the mechanism is not functioning and it should be changed, or maybe the people, individuals who are responsible of executing something are not fully committed to it or are not uh, doing their job properly. So monitoring is give you, can, has possibility to give you um, information while there is uh, enough time to transform uh, JAP measures in a way to make them more efficient. Uh, and um, I think I, I covered everything from the slide. So uh, on the other hand, evaluation, um, evaluation has also features which are common to monitoring, like it, it is good that evaluation should be systematic and uh, uh, happening at uh, uh, pre-planned uh, uh, temporal points, temporal nodes. Uh, maybe uh, first evaluation is meaningful one year after uh, the uh, acceptance or uh, the beginning of the implementation and then on regular uh, basis. Evaluation needs to be context sensitive in the sense that uh, you should uh, understand truly uh, the, the problem you are uh, dealing with and uh, whether it's something that is that could be fixed through 
in short period of time through some very concrete measures like quotas or changing certain um, criteria for career advancement or for hiring, or whether what you are dealing with is uh, a matter of cultural um, gendered bias. And that is something that cannot be changed uh, overnight. Therefore, you should think how uh, to subtly measure the subtle changes that you're hoping to achieve. So it is important to uh, evaluate uh, having concrete context in mind. And so the measurement of elevation is meaningful and applicable to your concrete institutional setting. Uh, evaluation needs to be timely in the sense that uh, um, evaluation should not be planned at the end of uh, gender uh, equality plan implementation, but uh, as I said, should be done uh, at various temporal points and early enough that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, interventions can be changed on the, uh, can, interventions could be made on the whole uh, um, process of institutional change. Evaluation should focus more on what is done rather than what has not been done, what was avoided to be done and uh, where we failed. So evaluation should always have an element of encouragement uh, and sensitivity to the, uh, to the all sensitivity to the sensitivity that gender as a concept has in our society and working environments. And evaluation should always be uh, guided by idea that it should uh, pave future actions, either by modifying the existing actions or by uh, through evaluation, we realize that we reached a certain point and that we are ready for more ambitious uh, targets uh, in the next phase of uh, uh, gender equality activities of the institution. So uh, important part of the evaluation or the key part of the evaluation are the indicators, uh, which are uh, ways to measure assessments uh, of the progress that has been uh, made. Uh, and um, uh, and that, uh, uh, I'm going to explain more about the different types of indicators uh, a bit further on. But before that, um, the evaluation, as I said, uh, should be always uh, maybe threefold. And that is understanding where we were before, understanding where we are, and understanding uh, what is more to be done. Uh, and of course, then uh, what is a suitable um, measure or a solution to the challenge that it still lays uh, ahead of us. Uh, now, the indicators. Um, they may be qualitative or quantitative. So we are all familiar with the quantitative indicators, the number of women, the number of uh, female researchers, let's say, the number of female researchers at highest uh, levels of academic ladder, number of women in um, decision-making bodies, or number of trainings uh, that we have uh, done, uh, workshops and uh, other uh, awareness raising campaign. However, um, we should always combine them uh, with qualitative indicators, which are trying to encapsulate uh, more the, the, um, the quality, the effect uh, that uh, uh, JEP measures are uh, making. Uh, so for instance, uh, how the understanding of uh, 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 gender dimension uh, as being related to any type of research, uh, uh, how it changed over time. And this is something that cannot be simply uh, measured through numbers. All, however, no matter whether they are qualitative or quantitative, all indicators needs to be smart. It means they need to be specific, 
concrete uh, and preferably simple, simple, so not composite indicators, which are uh, composed of, of uh, different uh, smaller indicators, uh, but um, something that is uh, specific, then it should be measurable. So uh, either numerical scale or uh, 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 description, which is uh, which could be compared, uh, uh, measurable, meaning that we need uh, a way to compare before and after uh, a certain measure. Uh, they need to be achievable. So we, we should not uh, set the bar too high, but should mm, think of what is meaningful and honestly expectable within certain uh, academic and cultural setting. Therefore, they need to be realistic. Um, the, the gender equality plan is not uh, a competition in who will write a better plan and whose plan is nicer, uh, but it's more about making a meaningful change in reality. And important indicators need to be time bound. So after certain period of time, we expect certain effect. Uh, we are setting bar to be achieved at a certain temporal node. And here again, we should be thinking about being realistic and uh, uh, that uh, indicator is actually attainable and not just preferable. Uh, so there are uh, four types of indicators. Um, and uh, this is what we are going to discuss in the working group. So I'm going to explain the main difference between these types of indicators. Um, output indicators are uh, helping us to monitor whether we are doing uh, what has been planned. For instance, uh, in your gender equality plan, you, you plan to have uh, raising awareness campaign, uh, preferably one per year, let's say for students uh, or postgraduate students or research group. Uh, output indicator would be a type of indicator that would measure whether um, the training was organized uh, in the given time and in the expected number. Uh, or uh, you may set uh, an indicator as a number of participants. You organize um, a, a round table on a certain issue uh, in around 8th of March, and uh, you hope that uh, you will gather big audience uh, and uh, therefore you want to reach certain number of people. This is your indicator. Uh, and it is uh, so this this is an output indicator uh, so output indicators are giving us information whether something happened whether people were reached uh, whether something was done as it was intended they are not giving us information about um, what uh, what effect these activities had. It's just indicating whether the activities happen or not. So outcome indicator is a type of indicator that is, um, that is measuring precisely uh, uh, this. Uh, that, no, this is impact indicator. Impact indicator, I'm sorry, is a type of indicator where you are measuring whether you achieved uh, intended impact. So for instance, it's uh, uh, your institution is already organizing round table dedicated to women in science uh, on every 11th of February, International Day of Girls and Women in Science. Uh, so your institution is already doing that. But uh, what you actually want to check is uh, whether it's changing uh, the opinions of the people. So, uh, or the, the changing the attitude of the researchers within the institution. This would be an impact indicator that you would measure uh, up after a a longer period of time, whether um, whether you achieved uh, wanted impact. Uh, for instance, whether 
more people are aware what is the purpose of this annual event of uh, that is happening on 11th of February, or uh, for instance, uh, whether uh, whether uh, you have a measure that is aimed at uh, increasing proportion uh, of women in decision-making bodies, uh, then in the longer period of time, you are basically checking whether this actually um, uh, came into effect. Now, uh, the indicator that is second in our list that I just jumped over uh, is an outcome indicator. Um, outcome indicator is somewhere in between output and impact in the sense it is usually um, so um, it is measuring um, it is a, a measuring uh, effect of, of a certain concrete measure but it is measuring it uh, through um, uh, it is measuring it whether the 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 measure is achieving the event the effect in a planned way. So it's best to think of it as something that is connected with the project. Um, uh, period and project uh, as a project activity. So if um, uh, if you are measuring whether the participants of your um, of your workshop uh, started to use the knowledge that you shared with them, this would be an outcome. Uh, indicator. So you are practically with outcome indicator, you're testing whether something is working the way you intended. Uh, it is different from output indicator because it's not only measuring whether something happened, but whether something uh, produced intended effect. It is different from impact indicator in the sense that impact indicator is looking into um, longer effects and it is also measuring intended and unintended uh, effects uh, of a certain measure. So sometimes a certain gender equality measure may be met with a huge opposition, uh, conservative backlash and would actually um, uh, create uh, unwanted, um, unwanted outcome. Uh, and uh, this is something you can measure with impact indicator, but is not something that an outcome indicator would uh, measure because outcome indicator is focused on measuring the intended, not unintended uh, results. And finally, process indicators are used when you want to measure a process uh, or activities. Uh, so it's, um, it's not really checking whether the process of institutional change is meeting its short-term or long-term effects. It's not even measuring whether uh, the, the, the the process is being done in the um, uh, uh, intended way, but it's, uh, so it's um, measuring whether the process uh, is ongoing. And this is also important for the kind of measures uh, where uh, the path is the aim. So for instance, if in your gender equality plan, institution is planning to uh, establish gender equality office or an off or a position of gender equality officer, a position that did not exist before. Uh, easiest way to measure this activity is to make it into output indicator, uh, office established, office not established. This would be one way. However, if you really are interested in making this office sustainable and genuine part of the institution, it would be more meaningful to divide this measure, this activity into various steps of, for instance, um, 
uh, building capacity of the employees, which are already employed, um, changing regulations needed, uh, internal regulations of the institution in order to establish a new office. Uh, making the whole hiring process if you're hiring a new person, then uh, informing employees that this new office is uh, established and is at their disposal. So each of these steps could be measured as output indicators, but if we look at it as one measure, establishing gender equality office, we can uh, try to find a way for instance, through steps to measure whether the process is unfolding in its uh, in the pace that we and in the way that we intended. Now, uh, we are. Uh, I, I just would like to share with you that since issue of indicators tend to be very challenging for uh, JAP implementators, um, there is. Uh, there are lots of useful tools, and I'm just giving you here information about one that to me seems to me most practical. Uh, but I'm sure that uh, on Gear tool that we a link that we shared beforehand, you can find uh, maybe indicate uh, um, uh, materials that are, uh, could be more uh, useful to the indicators that are applicable to your particular case. Now let's go to the group work. So now let's go to the final step of our um, uh, JAP circle, and that is sustainability. And I'm giving floor to Lorena. Yeah. Okay. So last last step. I hope you are all doing fine. We are all tired, but let's go quickly through this step because it's really an important one, okay? We were going to focus on step three, four, and five, so we won't have much time, uh, and we won't be able to do any activity um, regarding this one, but we have to choose. However, this is a really important uh, step of the process. We need to think about sustainability since the very beginning of the, of the structural change process, okay? Um, so what are the key uh, sustainability drivers when we strive for sustainability, okay? The key aspect. Um, the first one, we need to manage our efforts and our energy. And this is really crucial for sustainability. And we need to think here also in a personal, uh, with a personal and individual approach and not only with an institutional one. Because what happens here is that normally we are so much committed with the institution and with going ahead with the gender equality plan that we really put all our efforts and all our energies. And in the end, I'm sure that you all know here in this room that in the end, it comes to one, two, three people leading the process and asking everyone and dealing with resistances and negotiating and you know doing all the hard work. And in the end, this small group of people ends up really tired and really exhausted. And this is why we need to work with our allies since the very beginning. Look for your allies also for sharing this just to say with your cup of coffee, I cannot deal with this anymore. Only for that, because we need to take care of our own activism. The thing with the structural change process is that is very much related to activism and personal activism is something in which we believe, we really believe we want to achieve gender equality. And we really believe that we need a transformation of our organization, but we are dealing with a huge thing that is an institution with a specific culture that we cannot change only by ourselves. So manage your efforts and congratulate you for any minimal and 
whatever, you know, little achievement that you get during the day, you congratulate yourself, first of all, okay? And, and I recommend you to read uh, this paper um, uh, written by Jane Barry and Elena Diordevich. They wrote about, uh, and they talk about the sustainability of the activism. Uh, I will give you the link to the paper. It's called, What's the Point of Revolution If We Can't Dance? I think that's the title. And, and they talk about this, and they, they talk about all this, um, uh, about this burnout syndrome that is faced by lots of feminist activisms, activists. And um, they stress out the urgency of, of thinking about sustainability also of the activism, okay? So that's, that is the first point related to manage your efforts and your energy. Then for that, we need to work with our allies and build from there since the very beginning. We need to identify um, potential windows of opportunity at organizational, domestic, and also international levels. For example, having this uh, Horizon Europe requirement now is definitely a window of opportunity for many institutions that were facing resistances and that really were not seeing why they needed to work on this. Well, at least we have something to push now on this direction with, with these kind of things. And also, as we saw, sometimes risks and, and resistances can be turned into opportunities, as you show do, in, the, in the exercise before. No? Uh, then we need to embed the planned actions into the standard frameworks of the, and procedures of the institution for the sake of sustainability, okay? This is something, this is also an example that uh, we saw just in the exercise before, this thing of has this activity become part of the permanent plan uh, or program, training program of the institution? It is embedded, is this institutionalized? Okay, things like that. Next, please. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Okay, there, flexibility and resilience are uh, really important. We know that things will be changing along the way um, and we need to, to adapt all the time. We need to be adapting to the changes in the context and also changes in the priorities, which of course, you know also what I'm talking about, probably with all this COVID crisis, many gender equality actions were totally, you know, suddenly canceled or uh, they got directly out of the agenda just because the new priority is the COVID crisis. And then now we are learning that, wow, the COVID crisis really had an, a, a gender impact in our institutions. It really had a gender impact. So we need to be uh, uh, aware of these windows of opportunity and, and knowing, you know, linking all these things to, to be, of course, to be flexible and adapt to the new agendas, but also to, to, to see the windows of opportunity and try to push for it at all times. So we're going to be um, uh, not only to be flexible, but only to be resilient because many times we're not going to get it. So just go ahead, look for your allies again. Then, of course, I. Context specificity, uh, context specificity, we are clear uh, about that. We know there is no one size fits all solution. We get inspiration, but we always need to adapt to our context. Um, that's a clear one. Then make change visible. This is uh, also key for sustainability. Transparency is key for sustainability. And um, I cannot think in English anymore. Rendición de cuentas. Oh my God. Accountability. I'm sorry. <laughs> Accountability is really important also and is very much related with making uh, change uh, visible. But also it has to deal with other intangible aspects. And those intangible aspects are crucial for the, for the process. For example, motivation. 
So we are saying we have a gender equality plan, we are going to do this and we want to achieve that. And if we are achieving that, we need to make it visible with a positive narrative, with a positive speech and congratulating ourselves again and helping the people to get motivated and implicated in, in, in continuing with that. We need to say, hey, it is possible, okay? And put it at all levels. It is possible at the higher level and it is possible also at the very much individual level. So we know that we address everyone and we say to everyone, you can also do this just by changing your behavior in a meeting or just by changing how you, you address that people, that, that person with an inclusive language. So we need to make it visible for all the levels of the institution, how we are making change actually happening, okay? We need to build on existing resources, which is key for sustainability. For example, if we are in a, in a European project, what happens when it is over? What happens with the funds? So this is why we need to work since the very beginning on um, embedding the activities within the existing resources, which will lower efforts and expenses, um, but will also strengthen the integration and visibility and support from our levels, okay? And then we need to breed top-down and uh, bottom-up approaches and actions. And this is one lesson learned also from the sister projects that they are saying that those activities that were in fact bridging these these two approaches, they were the most the more the most successful ones. Okay, so um, I think that's it. Those are mm -hmm. the key aspects. I will end up again just saying: take care of your own activism, look for your allies. We all have a big and huge objective and goal ahead, but it's worthy. Just take care of yourself. Okay, and good luck to everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lorena. Um, can you give an example of such bridging activity, activity that would bridge top down and bottom down up? Down and the bottom up. Mm -hmm. um, activities that uh, in which we just mix for activity during the whole process is not only an activity that we put in the gender equality plan, but for example, if in the step two, when we need to do the analysis and the gender assessment, if we implicate uh, the top level with the mid level and the students or the lower level, it's not nice to say that the students are the lower level, but in fact, they are in many universities. Sorry to use this language, but we need to, if we uh, manage to do assessment activities that will join together these groups for assessing their own reality, where they can reflect with each other and where they can listen to each other, where students say, for me, the main problem at the institution is this one. And then the top management say, what? I never thought about that. And they can reflect, jointly reflect, and, and you can actually bring them together into a, a common conclusion or to a common goal. All the measures that you plan then to achieve that goal will be much more successful because it will bridge and it will motivate, it will serve as a bridge to motivate all the different levels of the institutions. So the, these bridging activities is throughout the whole process, okay? Not only when you plan the activity in the, for the gender quality plan, yeah. right? Uh, I have another concrete example from the practice, the, the change process that uh, I'm uh, uh, looking at the moment at uh, University of Ljubljana, where uh, in the recent months there has been a lot of discussion about uh, sanctioning or lack of sanctioning uh, sexual of sexual harassment, where students are the victims and perpetrators are the senior male professor mostly um, the well, there was a, a protocol which obviously was not functioning because uh, uh, the the public discussion started only when uh, a group activist group of students um, 
basically went into media and said that um, this is a systemic problem that is not adequately addressed. So what is happening now is that there is a, a working group involving professors, researchers, and uh, legal uh, staff, um, so legal officers within the university who are going through all the institutional regulatives, rewriting them and setting up a new protocol um, on uh, how to deal with sexual harassment, how to prevent it. This wasn't, uh, for instance, prevention was not part of the picture beforehand. And basically what, what, um, what is a new thing and it is enabled by this uh, general process uh, that was started with JEP uh, within the university was that uh, not only formal student representatives, but different student groups, including these informal groups of female students who went to media and started public discussion, they are invited on board uh, to comment uh, and to give insight what is wrong with the present system and what kind of uh, support would uh, a young student who wants to uh, report sexual misconduct, what kind of challenges she could be facing? They are, so they are invited on board. I'm sure that uh, they would not be invited uh, if this had, did not uh, happen to become a media scandal. But uh, this is, I think, a good example that of bridging top down, because you cannot change university regulative without, you know, agreement of Senate, uh, of the decision making body of the rector, you need top down, but basically they don't have knowledge and experience of a person to whom this regulation should be um, uh, tending to. So. Uh, you need information from the bottom. Uh, so just bringing, putting them to the table and involving different stakeholders, including those from grassroots initiatives into the change process would be this uh, bridging of top down. Um, so uh, we came to the very end of uh, our presentation today. Um, yeah. Uh, if there is any more reflection, please uh, do say so. Um, uh, what I want to, um, so we tackled a lot of different, very challenging and very complex issues like indicators or uh, you know, managing uh, response to resistances and um, risks that we may come uh, uh, that we may uh, uh, come along in the process of institutional change. Uh, but um, uh, what, I, what are my message uh, for today is to understand uh, the gender equality plan as a process of institutional change, not as a document with, which has its own temporality, but uh, I think we all believe in Gender Equality Academy that uh, a good way to understand the process is that already starting the conversation about establishing JEP is the beginning of the change. And of course, once you meet all the, uh, 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 all the outcomes that you intended in your gender equality plan, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the story. So it's a change process. Um, then each gender equality plan needs to be situated within the context of particular institution. There is no one size fits all, and there is no, uh, it, it is not meaningful just to copy paste solutions from other institutions or other countries. You, it's always um, uh, should uh, be relating and reflecting the context of the institution and the cultural and social setting. Uh, then work with your allies first and build from there and proactively address risks and resistances as we said before. So. Uh, keep your allies close, but uh, uh, keep your resistance 
resistors, uh, don't lose them out of your sight. Uh, or sometimes keep them even closer. Uh, this is the, uh, so the, this kind of institutional change should not be understood as radical, uh, you know, overnight change, uh, but rather as a gradual uh, and essentially radical change, but gradual in its uh, process and pace. And use potential windows of opportunity, as we said beforehand, and uh, we are all facing one of those with uh, new requirements for Horizon Europe. If Lorena would uh, like to add anything more? I will add, just as we started saying, don't lose sight of what should be at the core of it, which is gender power relations. We need to talk about privilege, find a way to do it, with your in, within your context, but we need to talk about privilege, we need to address privileges, and we need to be sure that gender is not evaporated in the gender equality plan and depoliticized. Size. Uh, French. <laughs> that you don't lose the political side of it, okay? And the, the, the highly political aspect of dealing with, with gender. We're talking about power relations here. So we need to tackle that. So that for me would be a key lesson and take care of your own acti activism. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for this inspiring uh, two, two last points. Uh, I will be uh, now posting uh, uh, ex exit questionnaire, which I uh, really would like to ask you to fill in now and not uh, leave it for later. Uh, 